Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the fourth of the Ames Rehab webinar series. Apologies for the slightly late start, we have some technical difficulties, but uh, it's all sorted now. Um, so today's webinar will be about inpatient mental health rehabilitation um, and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And it'll be with Dr. Raj Mohan, who is the consultant psychiatrist in South London and Morsley NHS Foundation Trust and also the chair of the Rehab and Social Psychiatry Faculty. Hello Raj. Hello there, Connor. Hello, everyone. And also we're joined by Sabina Berza, who is a consultant psychiatrist for Priory, Priory Group and also a member of the Ames Rehab Advisory Group. Hello. Hi, Sabina. Um, unfortunately, Sharon Salins, who was due, uh, due to join us today, has had some technical difficulties and won't be able to join, but I'm sure we'll be able to get through all the content with Sabina and Raj. So. For today, so this webinar is a live event. Essentially what that means is if you're an attendee, your microphone or webcam will not be in use during the webinar. Um, however, we do really want to hear from you and you have the opportunity to answer question, ask questions throughout the webinar. So there'll be a Q&A box um, on your screens and just use that to type any questions as we go along. The second half of this webinar will be dedicated to questions and answers. So we'll get through all your questions in the second half. Um, this webinar will also be recorded and uploaded to our website. So if you have any colleagues or you know of anyone who would be interested in seeing the webinar, we will be sending links uh, to the recording to everyone who attends today. Um, so before we I hand you over to Sabina and Raj, um, I just thought I'd introduce Ames Rehab. I'm aware that some of you who are joining may not be members of the network. Um, so Ames Rehab is a quality improvement network for both inpatient and community mental health rehabilitation services. Um, we do quality improvement through our quality standards, but we also provide a network and a platform for rehab services to share their practices and ideas. Um, so members go visit one another's services, they share ideas remotely, um, and the idea being that through the sharing of practice, everyone improves the quality of the service they provide. Um, I won't get into too much detail about the network. But if you are not a member and you would like more information, um, please email rehab at rcpsych.ac.uk or just visit our website. So, uh, without further ado, I will introduce um, Sabina, who has got some slides for us to, uh, to go through. Uh, I'll just get your slides ready now, Sabina. Thanks, Connor. Um, I, I think I'd, I'd really like to thank the AIMS team for bringing together these really helpful series of webinars and uh, thank you to everyone joining us today. I'm Dr Berza, I'm a consultant psychiatrist working in a longer term high dependency unit in Hartford in the independent sector as Connor mentioned. Um, and uh, I'm joined today by uh, Raj and we're going to talk about what it's been like to work in inpatient rehab services during this COVID pandemic. It's not such a new situation now that we've been in lockdown for almost seven weeks, although that is starting to change. I'm going to uh, start off with a bit of scene setting looking at where we are at now on a national level and then Raj will speak uh, after me to talk a bit about how his service has been addressing various issues that have been thrown up. Uh, we'll then open up to a Q&A. Uh, next slide please. So I think everyone will be familiar with the announcement made by Boris Johnson uh, eight days ago, looking at the easing of restrictions for the first time since lockdown. Uh, there has been some query as to the clarity of that message and also uh, perhaps some disagreement between the devolved nations as to how that should look. But essentially, uh, the message remains that we should stay at home as much as possible including working from home as well as avoiding public transport, social distancing for all and uh, self-isolation uh, should you develop symptoms remain very much in place and he introduced a new Covid alert system uh, which ranges from one to five with five being the highest and we're currently described at being at level four i.e that the transmission is sufficiently high such that the need for social distancing continues. Uh, next slide, please. So what has changed and how might that be impacting on rehab services? 
as of last Wednesday, uh, you're now able to meet someone you don't live with outdoors, but not in their home, as long as social distancing is maintained, which clearly has potential positive benefits for our service users in connecting, reconnecting with family and friends. A significant change is that we can now spend unlimited time outdoors, including travelling and day trips, although I do acknowledge that the message is also that we should be spending as much time as possible at home. And I think that is relevant for our service users as that confusion can already add to the difficulty that some of them may be experiencing in understanding the rules about what we should and shouldn't be doing. There's a return to work for what is described as essential retail, such as tradesmen. Uh, with possible future plans as early as the beginning of June for the reopening of schools and phased reopening of non-essential retail such as leisure centres and restaurants. And um, that should help, should it go ahead, with facilitating rehab with our service, with our service, within our services. The recommendation of homemade face coverings may also translate to a change in our practice um, as I think Many have identified that it can be quite difficult to maintain social distancing on the ward and it may be that some of our service users and, and maybe staff choose to adopt the use of these. There's been an increase in fines for not keeping to the rules and potentially automatic self-isolation uh, for those returning from abroad, although that's not yet in effect. But for those over 70 or those shielding, um, there's no change due to their higher risk profile and they do need to be continuing with the previous recommendations. Next slide, please. So where are we at uh, from a global perspective? Uh, this table shows the number of COVID cases, death and deaths and testing on a global level. Uh, and I think these figures are from Saturday. So the UK currently ranks as fourth highest in total number of cases, uh, but sadly the highest in number of deaths after the US and actually the highest in Europe as we've all been seeing in the media. This translates into being the sixth highest for deaths per one million of the population behind other hard hit European countries such as Spain and Italy. Interestingly, there are no figures for recovered or active cases, and I'm, I'm not sure if that relates to the situation we find ourselves in with testing. Although we come in as being sixth in terms of number of total tests, although that does include tests that have been sent out but not analysed, we've dropped to being the 37th highest in terms of tests per 1 million of the population, which is a significant change and not in a good way since our first webinar back in April. And there's certainly been a lot of noise in the media about access to testing. Next slide, please. So if we look at that in a bit more detail, um, we can see that there have been more than 240,000 confirmed cases of corona in the, uh, coronavirus in the UK. Uh, that figure is most likely much higher as it only includes those who have had a positive test. However, there is some good news on the horizon in that the number of new confirmed cases are falling since the peak in April, despite an increase in the number of people being tested. But there has been some concern about the possibility of seeing a second wave of infection, given the easing of restrictions over the last week. On a regional level, on the uh, map on the right hand side of the slide, uh, whereas cases were predominantly concentrated in London and the Midlands, we're now seeing hot spots in the north and south Wales and there certainly has been some regional unease about the loosening of restrictions in those areas. Next slide please. In terms of the death rates, uh, thankfully they also have been falling, helped by lockdown. The vast majority of deaths, about 90% of them have been in England, but they are still well above normal and so we are certainly not out of the woods by any means. You can see the red line on the far right hand graph which depicts weekly death rates at the moment and the greyed out section with the line underneath which 
represents a normal range in previous years. And although we are all really rather fed up with the restrictions, I think it is worth bearing all of that in mind in our practice and uh, with our service users. Increasingly, there has been particular concern about the number of deaths in certain demographics. And we've heard, uh, such as people over the age of 80, and we've heard a lot about the death rate in care homes, which uh, represents about a quarter of the fatalities and also uh, more recently in black and ethnic minority groups. Next slide, please. So there's been a whole gamut of guidance and updates for mental health services uh, from various national organisations covering a whole range of issues, uh, such as clinical things, how to look after people in mental health services who developed COVID, palliative care, medication issues with coronavirus, all the way to legal and estate issues. And actually it can be a little daunting to try and stay on top of it all, particularly at a time when we are also perhaps stretched more than usual from a clinical and workforce perspective. Although fortunately in my organisation that does seem to uh, be getting better. Um, and certainly in my organisation service, there has been some thinking about how to provide that information in a digestible manner for both service users and staff. There's also been uh, not, not national guidance, but uh, shared learning from other organisations such as uh, South London and Maudsley in Oxford, for example, the use of vitamin D um, and how to manage people uh, with coronavirus who are also on clozapine. A lot of this is available through the Royal College website and I've, I've certainly found that a, a really helpful resource. Next slide, please. So for me, there are some recurrent themes that arise from the guidance um, and there is some overlap between them and it's certainly not uh, not exhaustive. Um, I think parity of esteem is of primary importance and that refers to the fact that our service users should receive the same protection and support as other members of the public. And that includes perhaps taking into account the specific difficulties they may face, such as cognitive impairment or capacity issues and making adjustments to the clinical care and systems looking after them to account for that. And I think that's a really important concept for our service user group as they're not always able to advocate for themselves. Infection control is obviously a really big thread that pulls in a lot of things like cohorting on the wards with separation of those who are positive and negative for COVID, personal protective equipment. We've all been familiar with the concerns around appropriate and sufficient provision of this, but again, in my experience, that seems to be improving. I think testing is an interesting one that is being made available to inpatients being admitted uh, since the end of April. We haven't had any admissions to my service yet, but uh, it would be interesting to hear if that is happening in mental health settings now. The very, uh, the very familiar concepts of social isolation and social distancing, which isn't really easy for any of us, to be honest, but maybe additionally so for uh, our rehab service user group who may have difficulties adhering to it for a variety of reasons that I've mentioned, such as cognitive impairment or perhaps being too agitated. Working from home is being advocated, advocated but uh, I think that is quite challenging for inpatient services and I imagine is probably only feasible for a minority of staff. And related to that is uh, trying to implement teleconferencing, video conferencing, not just for families and carers, but also care reviews with care coordinators and community teams and for legal aspects such as tribunals. Another important uh, related issue is physical health care. I think we've all been having to consider more closely what is the most appropriate care setting for our service users. And I think we've all had to get used to providing more physical health care than perhaps we're used to, purely from the sheer volume that we've been seeing. And perhaps there's been a higher threshold for transfer to physical health settings, given the potential risks associated with that. But at the same time, 
uh, it's important that we advocate for our service users if they do require more acute care. Our service users aren't always particularly vocal and their needs aren't always prioritised. And I think the risk of being left behind is higher when the health service has been under such strain. Increasingly, as we move over into a more subacute phase, I think we will begin to see the impact of interrupted care in providing routine physical health care. Our service user group often have complex comorbidities from a variety of reasons, such as long term conditions, not accessing relevant services, and we will increasingly need to think about how we are supporting them with that. Where I work, all routine physical healthcare outpatient reviews have been cancelled and I think we've been very lucky to be able to work in close collaboration with our GP so that we've not experienced any significant adverse effects as a result. But as routine physical health care restarts, I think it will be important to ensure that our service users are not lost in the backlog. Staff being is of vital importance. Uh, keeping morale up in the face of multiple difficulties such as work for, workforce issues from self-isolation, insufficient access to PPE, uh, supporting people emotionally through sharing anxieties, for example, uh, maybe about working outside of their usual scope and sadly in some cases through bereavement and loss. And I think for me, there has been a coming together and a reaching out to connect with each other, which I think has always been done, but is now perhaps happening in a more considered way. And that's been really valuable. A big question in our service, and I'm sure in many others, has been how to continue with routine mental health care and in, and in particular rehab in what is quite a restrictive environment in which we're all being told what we can and can't do, which in many ways is quite alien to how we work in rehab in terms of uh, promoting independence and autonomy and working collaboratively. And I think it is about trying to think creatively about how we can keep that rehabilitative ethos going, having a balanced person-centred approach in terms of risk management, and staying flexible and adaptable. It, it is important, I think, to keep things going um, and keep on having a focus on helping people to move through their care pathway and, and move back into a community setting in the longer term. So I think uh, communication, collaborative working, mutual support, effective risk management and adaptability are, are certainly key aspects in in being able to help us move forward effectively. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of where I work, uh, the Priory Group is a, a huge organisation spread across the UK, including Scotland and Wales. It's the largest independent provider of mental health services, uh, but it also has two other divisions, which are education and uh, adult care, which is essentially residential care homes and some supported living. All our NHS services in healthcare are inpatient based and I work in uh, one of the approximately 30 rehabilitation services which range from mainly high dependency and longer term high dependency with a smattering of community rehabilitation sites. So um, the organisational response has needed to be wide ranging encompassing a variety of settings and it's not really possible to go through everything that has been done, um, but I, I thought I'd just mention uh, a few of the highlights. Next slide, please. So communication has been key. Uh, we have daily intranet updates covering a variety of what they call uh, frequently asked questions. So that has a variety of topics and contains links uh, to relevant guidance. So it's all in one place. We have weekly email presentations updating us on the current situation. Uh, Zoom meetings week on a weekly basis with our service line and um, there's also but there's also communication bottom up uh, such as having a dedicated coronavirus email address for queries and um, and there's also been a survey. There's been a lot of work updating policies and 
processes to provide guidance uh, to staff on how we should be working. Um, they've enabled remote working with distribution of mobile devices, conference lines and so forth. There's been significant support around workforce issue, uh, developing rotors for staff absences, flexible working across disciplines and uh, risk management for those who are vulnerable to developing a severe COVID illness. Uh, looking at staff well-being as well, such as guides on resilience and coping, uh, looking at how we use and distribute uh, personal protective equipment and also provision of relevant material for service users. And I, I could go on, but I think I'll stop there and Hi, thank you, Sabina. Uh, uh, Connor, but did, did you want to come in there, Connor? Uh, yeah, yeah. Are you, are you ready to go with your slides, Raj? Yes. Okay. Firstly, I wanted to say uh, thank you for all those people who have uh, registered today, and I assume that many of you will be working in rehabilitation settings. So I don't want to uh, spend too much time uh, talking to you about what rehab is or anything. But we all know one thing that uh, people in rehab have a number of characteristics that se separate them from people who are in acute wards or in general psychiatric units or uh, intervention services. They have a number of risks and vulnerabilities. But at the same time, there is no research to say that people with SMI are a particular risk uh, because of the psychosis alone. So we just need to keep all these th things in mind when you're thinking about how to manage COVID risks in an inpatient rehabilitation unit. Now, I work in a unit with uh, 24 inpatients. It's a high dependency unit, and we have people with very complex psychosis. We have people with comorbidity. We have people who are older, more people from ethnic minority groups and so on. So just wanted to say that well, what we started to do right at the beginning of uh, the uh, pandemic, uh, when we had the first uh, case on our ward for the week of the 16th March, I think, um, we decided that we had to do something at that point based on what we knew. So we started screening every patient every day. So we checked their temperature, pulse, breathing and oxygen saturation. It's like a modified news. And the whole idea was that we focus on prevention, make sure that nobody catches it if possible, and then consider risk of um, infection for particular groups and assume that if you detect early, you can isolate early and prevent spread. So I'm just going to present you with a large, uh, rather big table. So, so this table just summarizes all the different factors that we took into account to make personalized plans for people. So we looked at people's, obviously their age, because older people, um, ethnicity, because people from ethnic minority groups, and gender, because more men um, are at high risk. So we looked at people's mental state examination, uh, mental health status. Uh, we always allocated a dedicated nurse and a nursing team. We looked at people's pre-existing health conditions, made sure they were given all the information we could, and also made sure that they were given the right kind of information. We contacted the community teams, gave them advice about leave and social isolation. Um, sorry, it's not social isolation, but um, distancing and isolation. We looked at people who couldn't isolate. We talk, spoke to family members. We made an estimate of the risk and tried to think of people having a mitigation plan. Now, this table is presented so that we you get an idea of all the things we looked at. But basically, we're trying to find a way in which you can address that particular person's risk factors and minimize the risk of them catching or uh, spreading uh, the infection. So just to also show you that um, you know that protocols, guidance and things have completely changed um, all through this um, pandemic. We had different instructions at the beginning. We are, we're not quite sure what to do. There are some very basic infection control steps when it comes to a respiratory viral infection. So we knew that uh, high temperature and cough were the two main symptoms we looked for. So anyone with those symptoms, we made a simple poster and I'm showing the first, the top half of the poster here that all nurses knew that they were to be barrier nursed, isolated and to use PPEs. 
We swabbed them, did news regularly, and made sure they were eating and drinking well. So the next part of the poster is this. What to do if somebody has um, concerning new score, if oxygen sats are dropping, and how to manage. We're actually located away from the main hospital, so we have to call 999 and take people to hospital, and we didn't really have any problem with that. Now, you must remember that this poster was made um, exactly two months ago, and this kind of has been what we've been doing. Plus, we always thought about how to reduce uh, spread of the virus. I'll tell you more about this in a bit. So, in terms of um, helping people understand what was going on, we put up posters on the unit for patients and for staff, made sure that people had one-to-one -one discussions about their concerns, offered people written information, made sure that we had information available in different languages. We had one in Vietnamese, and the Red Cross produces some of this information. There was one in Mandarin we had, and made sure that each person had a care plan. And it wasn't so much about writing down the care plan, it was about understanding what we needed to do for that person or what they needed to do and where the issues were. Now, the one thing that gets disrupted during such a period is um, the actual care process because you're not seeing patients as much as you should. So we had to do away with ward rounds because there was a congregation of people. We also didn't do CPAs like we did before, but we were reviewing people much more often and offering to see people one to one using uh, personal protective equipment. So we're also engaging more proactively with people, but more on a one-to-one -one basis and always safe and distanced. So this issue with social distancing, it's, it's a very disturbing term because that social distancing is anything but what we do in um, rehab. So we always left the social part out of it, out of distancing. We want people to be socially connected, but distancing only for safety. So Below are some of the terms that we used. We always use the word physical distancing, protective distancing, safe distancing, and preventive distancing. And this had a bit of an impact actually, because you know safe distancing is very, very clear. You're only distancing for safety and nothing else, but you are remaining connected. So just to also look at um, how you incorporate the coronavirus bill, I'm sure some of you will remember what this was, and how you integrate human rights and people's civil liberties. So what we want to achieve is better distancing. So you inform and support people, manage those situations where someone's agitated and running around, uh, make sure that people have activities which are distanced. Um, I just noticed that there was a question from one of the attendees about reducing about AWOL situations. So it's about proactively preventing somebody from absconding. So you engage with people, make sure that the personalized uh, plans to prevent absconding and you manage risk, you treat conditions, but engagement is absolutely core to reducing AWOL and make sure that you have a plan to, to get the person back. Now there's a question of testing which we'll probably come to later. Capacity is spoken about quite a lot. Um, so what we want to do here is to enable people to make capacitous decisions to stay safe. So for that you give information, you support them uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, get family involved, get care coordinator involved, so that people are making good decisions. And, um, you know, 99% of our patients were able to understand, make decisions. In fact, what we found was some people who could have gone out weren't really going out. Now about taking legal measures, any step you take uh, using legislation has to be proportionate to the risk to yourself and self. You can't just do something just because there's a law saying um, uh, that you should really go out for um, a couple of times a day or uh, exercise for 10 minutes or something like that. So you have to use the frameworks of the Mental Capacity Act, some aspects of the coronavirus bill, but I have to say that we haven't had to use the provisions within the bill itself. I'm just going to focus a little bit about, uh, you know, what works in a rehab setting because we're a long term setting is working together. So well-being of staff is absolutely essential to ensure patients well-being as well. So staff having breaks, staff being looked after, staff having the right information, staff being supported by senior management and staff being able to shield. Uh, healthcare staff have been dying and a high proportion of people who died are from BAME backgrounds, which is such an important thing. And I don't know whether it's received the kind of attention it should. Certainly we haven't seen enough steps 
taken to reduce the high risk of mortality in BME groups. So the main thing is that we're all in this together. I'm just going to move a little bit away to just show you something about care homes and what's been happening there. Now, this is a new uh, focus for the UK, but this uh, table, I deliberately produced uh, the table from 11th of um, April, which, when it was first published. So there's no reason to say that we didn't know about the care home risks at all. If you look at the highlighted uh, column about the percentage of total COVID-19 related deaths in care homes, it ranges between 42 and 57%. We knew this a long time ago. Unfortunately, we are still not producing the type of data in the UK to know what's happening. But care homes have something in common with long term settings, such as a rehab unit. And what they found from this review, which was done by the London School of Economics, is this. The reason why there's more infections and more deaths is that staff are working while they're symptomatic. Plus, there are many asymptomatic carriers. Staff work between facilities. There's not enough PPE and that's going to constant source of problem. Not enough infection control practices. Um, people don't suspect that somebody may be developing COVID. No testing and also the general difficulty of identifying people with COVID based on symptoms alone. So we knew all this on the 11th of April and we've been late in implementing some of those things. Um, we really need to be prepared for the long haul. The governance uh, poster has changed slightly and in order for us to have control of the virus situation in future a number of things need to happen we need to have PPE we need to look after the well-being we need more resources and funding address inequalities we need more data we need more testing tracing and isolating and how we ease lockdown seems to have a very important impact and we need the vaccine so I just wanted to say I made a my own because the government seemed to be say, saying uh, things uh, not entirely science based. But what we need to remember is we are in for the long haul. We need to stay focused on prevention. We need to protect every group of people because spread is such an important thing to account for. And all of doing all of these things actually would save lives. So I'm aware that um, I've gone on for a bit longer and uh, want to have some time for questions. So I'm going to stop there, Connor. Do we have any uh, uh, questions? Yes, thank you, Raj. Thank you, Sabina. Um, we have had some questions come through um, throughout the presentation. Um, so. OK, so the first question um, is from an anonymous sender is I would like to know how to manage remote working amongst medical staff versus other staff and how to balance this with visible leadership. I, mean, I, I think that's quite um, an interesting question. It's certainly one that uh, we've had to look at in my service uh, because I think the difficulty is that most staff on the inpatient service um, are not able to work remotely and it's generally the more senior um, staff or the more senior medical staff that are able to do this and yet you're absolutely right um, I think there's a question of leadership uh, being able to lead from the front but what you're not able to do if you're at home well certainly not able to do as effectively um, I think in, in my service what we did we're trying to sort of balance the need for working from home and reducing um, the uh, infection rates. Uh, so I think we've taken a sort of a balanced approach where we've enabled some uh, senior staff to work from home um, on some occasions whilst still also coming in um, to be able to, to provide that, that visible leadership. I don't know if you've got anything to add there, Raj. Yes, I think it's a very interesting question because some people are working from home and others are working as usual, nine to five or more than that. And I'm in the latter category and I've had to deal with people working from home because there have been an increased number of teams meeting and meetings and various other uh, virtual meetings, which I've had to find time for on top of my usual work working hours. So it's, it's been a difficult thing and we haven't got the balance right at all. In fact, there are way too many Teams meetings, perhaps uh, too many webinars as well. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so this next question is, could you talk about challenges of managing substance misuse on wards and drug seeking behavior whilst distancing? Yes, can, shall I take this question? Yes. Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting point, actually. Um, on the whole, there is some understanding that there is the changes in how drugs are available out in the community because of the coronavirus restrictions. Or on one hand, some people say that, you know, certain types of drugs are flooding the market as well. Our group of people are particularly vulnerable. The social distancing and the restrictions have led to many people using less of drugs. And there was a question about people absconding as well earlier from somebody else. So um, what we do on our ward is that every person who the identified drug and alcohol problem is allocated a specific staff member as a dual diagnosis key worker. So we work very closely uh, together in a co-production manner to create uh, care plans and mitigation attempts. But primarily we've been managing that through engagement. We've been testing people for drugs during using urine drug screens a bit more regularly, but this always prearranged that we um, make sure that people agree to having the UDS done as part of a safety measure. I hope that's useful. Did you want to add anything, Sabina, or would you, should we move on to the next question? Um, no, I don't, I don't really have anything to add. I mean, I think I'm quite lucky for, I think partly maybe because we're an out of area placement, um, we find that we don't actually have a lot of the drug seeking behaviour on, on the ward. I think that's because maybe people aren't linked in with usual supply chains and it's uh, harder for them to approach people. I don't know. So it's, it's not something that we've uh, fortunately not ha had, to, had to deal with much. So okay. I think we're moving on to the next question. Okay. OK, um, so this next question is, can I please get a perspective from rehab units in the country as to how best to plan discharges amongst patients who have a placement and patients who need a new placement given the current restrictions? I can take that. Um, I, I think um, the guidance at the moment certainly is that uh, graded transitions uh, are not recommended. We're certainly not doing any graduated uh, leave at the moment, and I think that's because of the unnecessary risks associated with, with COVID. And what we're certainly trying to do is trying to discharge people in one go. And that, and we're not even doing a pre-admission visits, but what we are trying, and that's quite a big thing. I mean, it's a big move um, for, for people and not knowing where they're going can be quite anxiety provoking. So what we are trying to do is do things remotely, for example, um, showing them videos or brochures, helping them to meet people um, remotely through video calling um, and perhaps and putting them, uh, giving them sort of a week's leave um, just to make sure that everything's going to go OK and there are no significant issues uh, before discharging them in their absence. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that, Raj. Yes, uh, thank you, Savina, and thanks for that question. Uh, different care homes seem to have different thresholds as well. I've, I've noticed particularly that more recently, care homes are all asking for a negative test, test result. I don't think a negative test result means a lot uh, these days from the testing we have, but it's good that people are starting to think about those things. I've had uh, one patient's family come to me and say that they will not allow the patient to be discharged to a care home under any circumstances. And this has actually come about because of the new uh, media coverage about uh, social uh, care homes and the higher risk in care homes. So, and I completely understand where they're coming from. Um, and we have a situation about making this um, transfer work. I've had pressure from managers to discharge people quicker and I've had difficulties uh, making sure that things go smoothly and to plan. So one thing, as Sabina said, what you don't want a patient to do is to go back and forth. So trial leave is not really something, uh, a graded trial leave is not something that we, we've we been trying to do. Yes, so we, we do still have problems in terms of discharging people to residential homes or care homes. Okay. Okay, thank you both. Um, this next question is how can we support clients to develop their independent living skills um, whilst reducing the risk to themselves and others back in the hospital on their return? 
Yes, uh, if I may take this question. Again, a really important point. I think this is the area uh, where we have the biggest number of concerns because all of rehab is about social inclusion, it's about going out, it's about gaining skills, and it's not about being stuck on the ward. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has given us a situation where uh, our patients are not able to go out, they're not able to do the things they are usually doing. We've had to be creative around activities and um, interventions on the ward where people can uh, you know, practice their daily living skills. Um, many wards may not have the resources to make sure that each one of their patients has an access to the kitchen on every every uh, single uh, day, for example. So I have to admit that we have really struggled and we're just about uh, trying to come up with activity plans and programs for different people. So uh, for instance, all our patients who used to go to the gym are not going to the gym. People who used to attend uh, community drug and alcohol services are not able to go. People who used to attend college are not going. So we do have some difficulties there and it's no different to the difficulties that public are experiencing elsewhere, by the way. Um, I, I think um, from my perspective, it's been really interesting in my service actually, because we've had an uptake in people engaging in groups and activities. I don't know whether that's because they're just around more um, and there's more opportunity to engage with them or whether maybe there's a sense of solidarity within the service user group and perhaps feeling a uh, feeling of coming together and that we're all in this um, together. Uh, we've certainly tried to make um, adaptations, for example, uh, trying to continue uh, with groups, but obviously reduced level. Um, so not as many attendees uh, in, in order to be able to uh, adhere to social distancing. We're very lucky to have a ground, so we're able to do some of these outdoors, which is helpful, especially with the, with the nice weather. We've been doing one-to-one -one work um, and I think there has been more of an uptake in people sort of engaging in terms of their uh, daily living skills um, and, and also activities. OK, um, so this next question is how can we support patients to maintain family connections whilst we're not allowed visitors on site? We're using video calling, but is there any other suggestions? Yes, um, uh, thank you for that. And I think video calling has been such a godsend. Um, we've just managed to get enough um, uh, iPads and so on so that more people can use Skype and Zoom and various other functions. But at the beginning of the pandemic, when things were cut off, basically our patients were cut off from their loved ones and their community connections, we didn't have a lot of resources. So we're encouraging people to use uh, telephone. The staff were actually contacting the families more or less regularly, keeping in contact with them, giving them the information, reassuring them and encouraging them to call the patients as well. So I don't really have a lot of other suggestions other than using telephone and video calling. But I'd be interested to know what people have uh, done as well. I was going to add that since last week, you are now able to meet with one other person outside of your household. So we are, um, we're not having visitors to the unit, uh, but we are encouraging families to maybe come and uh, meet with uh, their, their relatives uh, in a local park. We're quite lucky that we're sort of semi-rural, so we've got quite a lot of open space around. And I think um, as as restrictions gradually ease, that will there will be the possibility of enabling uh, more face to face contact, which I think you know telephone and video calling is helpful. But often I find that, particularly with the service user group that we have at my unit, um, really the most effective thing is usually the the not for everyone, but, but for most, a, a face to face um, connection. Yes. Thanks, Sabina. And it, it, the thing is, the guidance also is uh, rather confusing, isn't it? You can't meet your family, but you can meet somebody else's family. It seems to seems <laughs> to be the case. <laughs> yeah.
Okay, um, so we've got time for just a couple more questions. So um, I think you touched on this earlier, Raj, um, but just to see if there's any more um, that both of you would like to add. So has anybody had any issues with patients in step down or rehab care homes where a patient would abscond or leave and then return a few hours later? How many? How are people managing this in terms of COVID safety for other residents and staff? Any suggestions? Uh, and I think these are examples. So individual contracts with patients, local mental health trusts for a patient to be transferred and observed or tested over a few days, etc. Yeah, if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll go back to that point. And I'd noted that it's such an important point. Um, uh, thanks for that question. So uh, there will definitely be some people with very high risk of absconding or overstaying their leave. And every time they're in the community, you don't know what kind of exposure they have had to the virus. So you have to treat people as potentially positive for the virus. So I'll give you an example. We had somebody who absconded um, last week was missing for two days. And when they came back, in uh, our trust has got a COVID ward. So we decided um, it was over the weekend that this patient was moved to the COVID ward. Now the idea is that they would actually observe the patient in isolation for seven days, do a test at the end of seven days. You can reasonably assume that this person is not positive for the virus and send them back to the ward. Unfortunately, what happened, uh, I found out this morning, was the patient was tested, but sent back to the ward. So. I guess the approach should be very personalized. You need to look at individual risk. How likely is this person to abscond? If they absconded, what are they likely to do? Would they be able to be safe in the community, distance themselves and avoid, you know, the sort of high risk situations like being in a crowd or shops or um, with a, a group of family members, for example. So I guess if somebody is um, AWOL for a short period of time, you assume that they are high risk of having come into contact with the virus and you have to isolate. So um, there are very few occasions where you do a capacity assessment to see if that person understands the risk to themselves or of course the risk to others as well. If the person is absconding and then going into a family which is isolating or shielding another family member, you have to look at those things. And this is probably where the coronavirus bill and uh, such things come up. You rarely have to take decisions based on risk to themselves and others, but so far we haven't had to do this. Sabina, did you want to add anything there? No, you pretty much said most of it. I was just going to say that it's for me, I think taking it back to basic, you know, why is this person absconding? Do they, are they putting themselves at risk? Do they really understand what's going on? There might be multiple reasons um, why they're absconding. That could be impulsivity, not capacity, they're not Maybe able to take it in. And I, I think, as you said, it's about looking at that individual person and, and trying to solve problem solve it from an individual perspective and being sort of flexible and, and balanced um, about your risk management um, and patient centered. Um, and, and ultimately, I think uh, a decision as to whether something more restrictive might need to take place will depend on that, that uh, risk management um, analysis. And maybe things like uh, maybe having someone escorting them might might help to um, help them to understand uh, how to maintain social distancing or um, maybe not absconded and uh, might uh, resolve the need for them to, to do that. OK, thank you. Um, just we've got time for one final question. Um, so this question is from Alsal, who's asked, do you think adding some specific psychological interventions such as CBT may be useful for these patients? I'm assuming he means those particularly affected by COVID, but then also I suppose the wider question would be, you know, has psychology been affected at all on your units given the current circumstances? Yes, uh, if I may take this question and thank you Absal, for uh, pointing this out. I guess I'm going to start by saying that um, the response to the extra distress caused by COVID is a multidisciplinary one. Psychology definitely has a huge role to play because we've seen that many people have developed uh, heightened anxiety symptoms and at least one of our patients has gone to uh, have symptoms which look like a relapse. Um, there are people with, uh, you know, uh, avoidance and market social avoidance which will then lead to other problems. So all of these things have um, indicate that we need to have psychological interventions and CBT has definitely has a significantly important role. Um, I don't think there's anything called CBT for COVID as such, but it is about understanding uh, people's needs and treating specific conditions. And 
strengthening the one-to-one -one interventions and be it nursing or occupational therapy interventions or psychological interventions, I think CBT has definitely got an important role. I mean, from my perspective, it's it's been quite interesting actually because we had a number of uh, COVID cases on the ward, and as a result, we had to, the whole unit had to go into isolation or lockdown, um, and we had to stop. We were told we to stop um, all face-to-face -face therapy. And actually that was quite difficult. So our psychology staff were trying to do that on the phone, but uh, I think it was it was quite difficult actually. We didn't get a lot of uptake. And since uh, the therapist staff have been able to go back in, I think there's been a real welcoming of them actually uh, from the service users on the ward. Um, and we've certainly had some more engagement um, in, in psychology and, and, and in both one-to-one -one and, and in the groups, which has been uh, really good to see and I think as well I just said is is incredibly useful to ad address a variety of uh, issues that have arisen as a result of uh, the pandemic. Excellent okay well I think that's all the time we have um, for questions um, so just to uh, quickly say um, that we do have one further webinar booked um, for the 1st of June. It will involve care engagement and support and will be hosted by Veronica Kamerling, who's um, done a lot of work um, around care engagement, is also a member of the Ames Rehab Advisory Group. Um, this webinar will be available to members of the network only and it would actually be done through Zoom. Um, so the difference being is that it will be one kind of big discussion between everyone taking part so everyone will kind of be able to share their ideas and practices around care engagement and as I said Veronica is very experienced in that area so she should be able to provide some advice advice and guidance to attendees as well um, so that's on the 1st of June uh, between 11 to 12 so in two weeks time um, but yeah I just wanted to say firstly thank you Sabina thank you Raj um, it's been very very helpful I hope all of you who attended found this useful and yeah thank you for taking spending the time with us today thank you thank you Connor thank you very much to to you and to everyone joining us thank you thank you bye-bye